Hello, and thank you for joining. My name is Anya Kaplan, and I'm head of operations and events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. Before we dive in, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. As many of us at this point are very familiar with Zoom, there are some great features that we encourage you to use. One of them is the comment box. Feel free to send a chat to the panelists as the discussion is happening. There's also the Q&A box. Feel free to send in your questions and we'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment of the discussion. And now I would like to introduce our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thank you, Anya, and welcome everybody tonight to our latest masterclass session. And the theme tonight is concept to consumer through a DTC lens. We're really, really pleased to be joined tonight by our friends and partner and supporter, MeUndies. Uh, thank you, MeUndies, for everything you do for us and in turn for our scholars. Um, and I'm especially pleased tonight to introduce the moderator of the event, Jeff Camara, who's the VP Merchandising and Design at MeUndies. Welcome, Jeff. And Jeff has with him his colleagues, Kristen Cushing, who's the manager of print design. Welcome, Kristen. Um, Stacy Cote, who's the director of product development and production. Welcome, Stacy. And Christina Roth, senior director, inventory planning. Welcome, Christina. Jeff, I'm going to turn this session over to you. Great. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everyone, for having us. We're excited to be here. I uh, wanted to start off by giving you an overview of the MeUndies brand, for those of you who may not have heard of us. Uh, so MeUndies is an e-commerce brand specializing in premium underwear and loungewear essentials. We originally set out with one goal, and that was to make the process of buying underwear easier and more enjoyable. We quickly learned that people want to wear the softest undies they can get their hands on, and they want to express themselves with bold colors and adventurous prints. So we offer them both of those things. So we set ourselves apart through fun, expressive designs and prints. Um, but at the heart of MeUndies is really a premium product of uncompromising quality. We're known for selling underwear in our signature micromodal, which is a sustainable fabric proven to be much softer than cotton. But aside from underwear, we offer bralettes, socks, loungewear, accessories, and most recently we launched swimwear this year. We also introduced the dog hoodies since we love our pets and pet owners can now match with their canine friends. So go out and get yours. Um, but as you can imagine, um, throughout the pandemic, we've experienced a number of challenges, production delays, shipping delays, launch dates have shifted around. But over the past couple of years, our business continued to grow. Customers are quarantined at home, shopping online. Um, so our business stayed strong through the pandemic. But the biggest shift we've seen, as you can imagine, is in loungewear. This new way of life working from home only boosted our loungewear business, and we continue to see that as an area of growth. So that's product. But aside from the product, our different, differentiating factor is really our membership program. And that provides convenience and savings for those who want to gradually build the ultimate underwear drawer. So these members receive a fresh pair of undies each month in the latest print or color. One month it's koalas, the next month it's pizza, but they love the surprise and delight each month. Um, and members also receive discounted pricing on all other products. So these are our super fans and it's a way for us to really build and connect with the community, receive direct customer feedback and encourage customer loyalty. So hopefully that gives you an idea of who we are as a brand. Um, and now I wanna dive into who we are, our roles at MeUndies and how the product gets from concept to consumer. So again, I'll start with my background. Um, I'm Jeff Kamara, VP of Merchandising and Design. I actually studied economics in college. Um, didn't know what I wanted to do, but knew I loved fashion, I loved trends. And my first job out of college was with Gap Inc at their headquarters in San Francisco. I entered their training program, not knowing anything, no experience, um, and learned merchandising, production, and planning. So really got to understand the whole product life cycle and found that merchandising was right up my alley because um, it combined the creative with the analytical. So as a merchandiser, you have to have a strong eye for product, but also the ability to utilize financials to understand what the customers are looking for. So it's a, it's a combina combination of creative and analytical to make sure we're making the right products for the right customer at the right time. Um, so after Gap, I went on to work for a few other brands. I worked for Coach, moved in New York City. I always wanted to live there, experience the fashion world there, even though I'm from California. Um, and so I worked for Coach at their buying office. 
I worked for Disney, developing apparel lines for Disney with princesses, Toy Story, Marvel, all different Disney characters, which is very different from true fashion, but it was a fun, fun place to be. It's the happiest place on earth, um, as they say. Um, but I also worked for Seven for All Mankind to understand the denim world. Premium denim, it's a, it's a unique space. So it was an exciting time to lead uh, merchandising for them as well. I also went on to business school, got my MBA. And really that just helped develop some leadership skills helping me today in my role. Um, so all of that brought me to MeUndies, which i am been super fun. It's been a super great ride. Um, it allowed me to take all of those experiences from these larger corporations and bring, have a bigger impact in a smaller brand that's been growing and it's direct to consumer, which is a space I wanted to learn more about. So with that, I needed to build a merchandising team. So I wanted to start by describing who that is at MeUndies. Merchandising is a critical role in any retail organization. They're responsible for developing, communicating, executing the overall product strategy for all categories. So they really serve as a cross-functional lead in building consumer-focused product assortments that will drive growth and product profitability. So what do they do on the day-to-day? -day? So at the beginning of each season, merchandising, they're kicking it off. They're really analyzing sales. So what is selling? What's not selling? What do you want to go deeper into? What do we want to take a step back from? But also analyzing trends, looking at the market, shopping our competition. What are our competitors doing um, any voids in the market, anything we should be doing in a better way, um, looking at runway shows, looking at aspirational designers, so really getting inspiration from all sources. But we also have a consumer insights team internally that they tell us what our customers are hearing. I think that's the great thing about a direct-to-consumer brand. Our customers tell us what they want. So at the beginning of a season, merchandising gathers all this information and creates a roadmap. Um, and that roadmap is really, it's a list. It's a list of styles of what we want to develop into, what new products we want to create. And along with that, we create a pricing structure. So that helps define what materials we want to source at the right cost so that we can hit that price at a great margin and be profitable. Um, so they're doing all these things, establishing pricing strategy, and that creates a clear guide for our design team. So we hand off this roadmap to design and for every style that we want to see, design sketches. They start sketching and creating different options, different details, different construction, different silhouette options. Merchandising can then narrow it down and pick, well, what's really right for our customer? And that's what we want to move forward with. So once we narrow that down, editing it down, um, that's the buying process. We select those items and our design team, they create a more detailed tech pack. So that has... A more a technical sketch, has key measurements, has design details, all things that a vendor can use to create our first sample. And that's really how the design process starts. So at the same time we're designing these new products and silhouettes, we're designing prints. As we mentioned, we introduce new prints every week. And so our print design team is really critical to our success. Um, so that's uh, Kristen Cushing leads that team. And so a lot of the fun print designs that you see on our site today, she has hand drawn from scratch. So I definitely want to take it to her next, um, bring Kristen in the conversation. So Kristen, why don't you tell everybody about your background and how you got to where you are? Amazing. Well, that's a tough act to follow. I mean, I, I just, I love working with Jeff and the merch team and like just hearing their process over and over again, that never gets old. So uh, we have a dream team here and uh, thank you, Jeff. I am Kristen Cushing. I am the manager of print design and I love my job. So I'm gonna just tell you how I got here and what I do every day. And you're gonna love it probably just as much as I do. <laughs> so I have always seen myself in fashion. I had always seen myself doing something in fashion since I was a little girl. Uh, but also being an illustrator. So it, it was so hard for me to put that together growing up. So I went to art school and sort of developed my craft and worked as an illustrator, but I still wanted to be in the fashion industry. And self-expression was very much my understanding of the fashion industry. So that's what drew me to it. 
uh, I just love helping people to express. Even when I would work with clients, that was sort of my catchphrase was, how can I help your vision become a reality? Like I always wanted someone else to express themselves and how I could help them do that. So uh, I was very glad to find MeUndies at some point because uh, that really matched my values and ideas of being in fashion and still helping people self-express. So when I first started my career out of college, I went to Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio, and I loved that it was just sort of in the middle of nowhere and just rained all the time. And so I just sat at home and worked on my craft, <laughs> just as I love to do still today. <laughs> Um, and when I first started out, I was a children's book illustrator, which made sense. And I wasn't in the fashion world yet, but I knew I'd get there eventually. And I also had as my own sort of self-propelled side gig, uh, Instagram was developing, which this is maybe aging me a bit. But uh, I remember my buddy had an Instagram and I was like, what is this? You can share photos and like, like them and talk about them. It's so cool. My visual language. So yes, please sign me up. So I had a doodle a day Instagram that I practiced, you know, doing a drawing every morning. I gave myself 10 minutes and a theme and I would draw something every morning and drawing characters that were emoting something or being very punny and playful. And I just always wanted to use my talent for good. And I kept up with it until I had hundreds of drawings and tens of thousands of followers and lots and lots of characters. Uh, so this is how I found, you know, doing what I love. And this is how the world found me as well. Um, you know, do what you love and you'll just be the best at it. That's what happened. So I got all my dream jobs from that one daily practice of just doing what I love. So that's probably my best career advice I can give you. Um, and then, you know, a lot of what I did in that doodle day is still what I do as a print designer. So I have a few of my little faves hanging up behind here, which is like, a few of my sketches that I've worked on as well, the actual sketches that I used for the prints and then some of the prints next to them, just so you can have those as a visual. Some top sellers back there. Oh yeah, some top sellers. Yeah, Jeff knows about it. We've got some nudes, we've got dinos <laughs> and this gecko print for swim is like my fave. So I had to have uh, Baby Yoda as well. These are just really my collection. If I could just go in and start my own store, those would be it. Uh, so yeah, so I just, you know, I would think of a character and it's still what I do today. So a lot of what I did in Doodle Day is what I do every day for my job as a print designer for MeUndies. Uh, I think of a character, I dig up a trending item and then add in you know, a funny pun or like an attitude to that character. And that's sort of the recipe for success for our big hit prints. Um, and I work, you know, cross-functionally with every team, like Jeff said, you know, we dig into what our customer is asking for and things like that. That's really a huge hit comes from a lot of factors. I'm not the only person that makes that happen, but I'm very privileged to sort of make the thing that the customer falls in love with at some point. Uh, but yeah, I draw everything with a sketch and then ink it and then bring it to Illustrator to vectorize it. So I have one of my original sketches here. You can see this. So this is the final ink drawing that then became Taco Love, which did really well on our Valentine's Day. Ooh no, I mean, a yeah, this is a perfect example of a hit. So you have a fun character personifying some cult following that everyone loves. And that's really our secret, at least my secret sauce coming from my drawing desk over here. And I've always been, I was a caricature artist at Six Flags. That's what got me through college. I've always been drawing faces. That's always been my thing. I took every opportunity in art school to take um, figure drawing and portrait drawing. I just always thought that there was something about the light in the face that people can see. So I put a face on anything that, that they let me see <laughs> because I really think you can feel the emotion of the character through the eyes. Um, so yeah, so anyways, uh, once merch decides on calendar of the prints, then I send to our factory in the begin, you know, the physical proof approval process on fabric. Um, and we work, you know, cross-functionally to decide on calendar moments and revenue driving ideas and digging into what our customer wants, as I said. And then before you know it, it's in the hands of customers all around the world for years to come and all over Instagram. And it's a very rewarding thing to see everyone just light up when they receive the product. So I'm very fortunate. And you're amazing at your job. Oh, um, well, thanks, Jeffrey. Kristen, we can put on record. 
Oh yeah, it's on. It's, it's just being. Yeah, recorded. it's been recorded. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm gonna make that my ringtone. Uh, but Kristen, why don't you tell us how it's different drawing for fabric, for apparel, for textile hmm. versus your previous roles as an illustrator? Yeah, uh, great question. So every single print that I make has to feel fresh and new. So that's one challenge. Um, you know, typically when I would work for a publisher or something, I'm drawing the same characters over and over. A big challenge here is that I have to bring, even if we do dinos for like the third or fourth time, I have to bring something fresh and big and fun every time. So that's a challenge, number one. Uh, and also number two would be that it's, it, you know, working on fabric, you're working with dyed, you know, elements and it's it's a very tricky process i can only work with nine colors i can't use any gradients or photographs or anything i have to use only illustrator vector art and you know i think that's part of where i'm perfect for this role and where this role really found the universe put me here because that's something i engineered early in my um, career was this way to make something look hand drawn uh, and still be computerized and vectored. So there's something, a sensibility, I believe in my line work that people read it immediately, that it's not manufactured from a computer. It's not been like, you know, hauled out through a factory with no personality. You know, that tends to be the sentiment with some of these bigger companies that have just been cranked out through a machine. And since I do hand draw everything, I wanted it to feel that way. And so it does. So there's sort of this way that I draw it and make sure the ink is perfect. And then I take a photo of that drawing and bring it into vector, which is the communication with the factory. And so it's not just like a drawing I can sell at a gallery just as is. I really have to make it feel like it's a breathing piece of art on fabric and you know manufactured you know hundred thousand times over. So that is definitely the challenge with my role. So great question. I love talking about that. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's really I, hard. <laughs> I, I think another piece that is different in this role for you would be the amount of feedback you have to take from other cross-functional partners. Can you talk about what that's like as an artist to have to hear feedback from different perspectives, whether oh, yeah. it's positive, negative, and how you've learned to adapt to that. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, just ignore all the feedback and just do whatever you want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did as a freelance artist. That works well when you're working on your own and you can just be your true self and, you know, fly your freak flag. But, you know, when you're working with a team, you really have to be moldable, the changeable, go with the flow. I think something that helps me, and I love that question I do, because it's something I feel like I've grown in, hopefully, um, that, you know, as an artist, you you have these objectives in your mind, right? So you have to check your, your win, which is what I call it. And so what is my win? Is my win for my ego to win? Is my win for me to be right? Is my win for my art to make me famous? No. My win is to drive revenue <laughs> and my win is for the customer to love and connect with each character. So I always check myself on that when I get feedback from a merchandiser and it's been, you know, mold over different times where the factory has an issue or something just, you know, slows me down as an artist where I'm on my win and I'm on my mission and I got to get there. It feels like it's stopping me, but actually it's helping me click into gear, which is uh, to create the true win, which is to drive revenue and to have the customer fall in love with the product. So. I've learned to release and you know adhere to all of the feedback and take it in as a positive thing. I really have, and that's a hard thing to do as an artist. So like, that's a great question because I think to be a professional artist, you have to constantly be inspired, which they say the best inspiration is a, de a deadline, which it's true, and uh, and to constantly take feedback and to not take it personally. You know, so you just kind of check your ego at the door and you say, "What's my win today?" Uh, or this week or this season for this print, whatever it is, and just really, you know, lay down what you think should happen or what you think the win is and really include the team, which always makes it better. So great question. I love that. Yeah, I think it's just a, it's a great lesson with how we all work together. We have to constantly remind ourselves of what our common goal is because yeah. we work with a lot of creative people and creative people are naturally very passionate about oh, yeah. what they do. Um, so it, it takes a lot of putting ego aside and really understanding what's the objective here. So yep. Kristen, thanks for all of your insight. Well, 
Well, thank you. Great questions. This is so fun. And thanks, everyone. <laughs> and I think there was maybe questions coming in, but I think we'll be answering those at the end or something. So we can wait till the end. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, what's your favorite print, though, before we pass it to Stacey? Oh, well, uh, my favorite print, I think, would probably be that's a great question, also, because I have several favorites. Unicorn? Uh, I think it would, huh? Unicorns. I was just going to say, I wish I had the unicorns here because that's my favorite. I honestly think it's in my laundry because I have all the onesies and everything. I wear them all the time. But yeah, I think it would be the unicorn print. And I remember when I first started at MeUndies and I was basically one of the only people on the product team besides production. And I was just doodling one day and I said, I think we should really do a unicorn print. And I had thought in my mind, it's MeUndies. They've already done a unicorn print. I'll just reinvent it and make it fun. And uh, the founder said, no, we've never done a unicorn print. Like just whip something up, see what you come up with. And then sure enough, I was like, I just did the first me on these unicorn print. I can't believe it. And then it's just sold like crazy. But yeah, so I love that print for several reasons because it's kind of my own mascot because I'm definitely a unicorn. But it's also because it was this moment where I kind of introduced my drawings to me on these and it was really well received. Yeah. There, so that's a special yeah. one. It is a special one. I agree. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks. Um, so great. So once these designs are ready to go, we pass it to product development and production. So I want to bring Stacy into the convo. And first, Stacy, why don't you tell us about your background and how you got to where you are? For sure. Uh, well, those are two very hard acts to follow. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Stacy Cote, and I am the director of product development and production at MeUndies. Um, I actually found myself in this industry by happenstance. Uh, in 2007, I moved to Los Angeles and took a temp job at Juicy Couture as a data entry clerk, helping them move over to a new PLM, product lifecycle uh, management system. Um, that's when I got a glimpse of production and expressed an interest in a production assistant role that was opening, um, got the job. Um, the atmosphere was insanely infectious and every day presented a new challenge, still does. Uh, I instantly fell in love though with the chaos, the planning, the coordination, and most of all, watching all of our ideas come to life. Um, it was only supposed to be a small stint there, turned me on to where I sit in my career today though. Um, I've been in apparel manufacturing for 13 years and I've been with MeUndies now for two of those years. And now I get to find myself sitting on a panel next to these lovely human beings, bringing all of our buys, styles, and prints to life. Amazing. And why don't you talk about how we do that? How do you take oh, yeah. a tech pack or design that Kristen creates and how do we bring it to life? For sure, yeah. Um, well, the first start, um, kind of kicking off from kickoff, what we call internally. Um, for the development process starts with our merchandising and design team. Um, they provide the general direction of whatever this new item is that we wanna sample and eventually, eventually buy into uh, based on that style, fabrication, printability, and the units that we're looking for. Um, then the product team begins sourcing for those. Um, we touch on our current supply base and then we'll reach out to a secondary supply base if we see that those items are a bit more unique than their capabilities. Uh, fabric's always paramount for us. It's our primary focus for any initial outreach that we conduct. We have to be very specific to the need that we're trying to satisfy while ensuring that it sustains the DNA of our brand. Depending on what we're trying to develop into and how many sources we contact, we could get anywhere from five to 50, to 50 different fabrications to choose from. Some of the fabrications come in and they're perfect and we're able to adopt them as is, whereas other times what we're looking to achieve is a bit specific, so we need to develop it from scratch exactly like what we did with our French cherry. Fabric will also drive the number of units you have to buy due to certain minimums attached to it. Christina knows very well, very much about this. Those are called MOQs and MCQs, minimum order quantity and minimum color quantities. These have to remain at the forefront of all of the sourcing that we conduct and ensure that we're seeing and presenting everything that's feasible, requiring alignment between merchandising and planning for the proposed unit buy size. As fabrics being dialed in, the same approach is taken for manufacturing, looking to our current and prospective factories as needed. Some factories and mills are vertical, which means they do both the fabric and the manufacturing. This is advantageous as it cuts down on cost and time. Time is reduced because the fabric mill is usually in the same building premise or somewhat close proximity to the factory. Cost is then cut down since there's no third party marking it up from the fabric uh, for the fabric and as well as transportation cost savings. 
Manufacturers also have minimums that need to be met there as well. Christina, big fan, long time listener, uh, that need to be met in order to be able to place their production in that factory. So both the fabric and manufacturing minimums where they both exist need to be reviewed together. During or at the end of sourcing, depending on how long it takes to find what we're looking for, a design handoff meeting is conducted. This meeting connects merchandising, design, tech design, product development, and production to discuss the precise intent of this new item that we're looking to. We review fit, trims, fabrication, construction, finishing, general purchase volume, and costing expectations to understand what any immediate limitations might be as it relates to design, intent, and margin. Next is where our tech designers create the technical packages, which is essentially our first step in taking our idea onto paper. Those are then sent to the factory to begin sampling for our first fit. After receipt of those first samples, fittings are then conducted, where a model is brought in office and our tech designer sits with our merchants in the first fitting to nail down all the necessary corrections to achieve the intended fit, as discussed in the design handoff meeting. And then a normal fit cycle for us is about four rounds of fits, a wear test, a PP, and then a TOP. The wear test is pretty unique to MeUndies, as that means several members on our team get an, this new item that we're developing in their size, wears and washes it, you know, wash, rinse, repeat type of thing several times to call out any functionality issues with that item. This helps us ensure that the products are properly tested and vetted for varying body types and different use cases before heading to our customers. A PP is a pre-production sample that's the last sample stage before the factory would begin bulk production. Uh, a TOP sample means top of production, which is quite literally the first sample that's snagged off the production line and it's sent to us for approval on quality before the goods are eligible to then ship. At around that same time, TO, at around that same time the TOP is shipping to us, there is a QC, a quality control check that's conducted at all of our factories. Upon a passing QC inspection, goods are then officially allowed to ship. At around our fourth stage is when our purchase order is cut to the factory that outlines our units, cost, and quantity while referencing back to the quality that we've sampled into. And this is our binding agreement with them. Um, factory production is about 30 to 150 days. We are currently at about 130 to 150 days due to various reasons, you know, COVID constraints and or some fabrications just kind of take a little bit longer. Then their goods are shipped to the fulfillment center and that takes about 110 days right now if anyone's seen their amazon delays similar deal for us our stuff is delayed as well um upon receipt though then those goods are again inspected to ensure that the top and qc in region match back to the item just delivered and then they go into our system for fulfillment that was a great overview i mean <laughs> those delays we we can see these cartons sitting out on that long beach port just sitting there waiting to be unloaded it's been a big <laughs> big issue um but i'm glad you mentioned the wear testing because i think that's something that we are super focused on on for our customer is making sure that we're proud and we actually try the products that we're putting out there so that was a good point um the last thing uh stacy i wanted to ask about was how we ensure quality control and making sure that what we're getting in full production is what we asked for. For sure. Great question. Uh, something that everyone's, every business kind of struggles with that, making sure that, hey, we've got this widget that we want to design and how do we make sure that we get it in-house being that nine times out of 10, you know, it might be produced in a different country. Um, so we actually have, we partner with our factories. They've typically got inline and final QCs that are con conducted on their behalf, just in terms of, you know, maintaining their own uh, workmanship throughout what they're signing up to with our, with the customer, which is us. Um, we also kind of double down on that just to make sure that everyone is indeed following exactly what we're looking for. So we employ um, a third party uh, who is Bureau Vistas, who um, is a third party that exists out in the world. They do audits and QCs. So they go to our factories on our behalf to make sure that everything tracks that technical package that I mentioned earlier that our tech designers send out. They'll actually go through that sample as well as the PP, which again was that pre-production sample before we go into production and make sure that all of those match. They will literally walk the production floor as individuals are sewing, as they're packing, as the boxes are being labeled, making sure that every single detail matches back to what the intention was. Um, similarly, we produce quite a bit um, in uh, Sri Lanka and we employ two QCs out there. So they are they are MeUndies QCs and they go there on our behalf and they're just constantly 
and QCing all of our goods just to make sure all of our members are getting exactly what they expect and all of Kristen's lovely prints come in as exactly how she approved them. Amazing. <clears throat> Thanks, Stacey. Sure. Appreciate it. So now we've set the roadmap, we've created new designs, we now have sourced them. Before we can actually place that order, we need to determine how many are we buying of everything. So I want to pass it over to Christina, who heads up our planning division. Um, but Christina, why don't you tell us about your background and career path? Thanks, Jeff. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to share my experience at Meet Undies alongside this awesome panel. It truly is a dream team. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Christina Roth, and I'm the Senior Director of Inventory Planning. And I've been with the company for just over two years, and I've been in buying and planning for the past 16 years. So to back up to how I got to this in the first place. So to be honest, going into college and in college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after college. I majored in communications with a minor in political science. And after my junior year, I took a summer program at the Graduate School of Business, which piqued my interest as I loved learning about what it takes to start a business, grow a business, and all the fascinating pieces that make it work. So shortly after that program, I ran into a friend who had graduated the year before, and she was running a booth at a career fair on campus. And I recognized the name of the booth, which was Robinson's May, which at that point was a big department store chain similar to Macy's, which eventually folded into Macy's. Uh, she described the executive trainee program, which she had just completed and was raving about, which basically sounded like an extension of the business program I had just done. And that it was basically like a three month crash course of buying, merchandising, planning, marketing, operations um, that ultimately placed each trainee into a buying department as an assistant buyer. So that sounded perfect to me as another way to keep learning about the different functions of a business and a great way to find what I was ultimately most interested in within that. So that began my career with a move back to LA from the Bay Area, and I've been in the buying and planning world ever since. So after some time as an assistant buyer at Robinson's May, I moved on to a buyer role at Shoes.com. And since we didn't have a planning department at Shoes.com, each buyer was their own planner. And that's when I really dug into planning for the first time and realized that my interest and strength was more on the analytical and numbers side of the process. So from there, I took a planner role at Skechers, where I stayed for 12 years, first in the domestic department, and then I moved over to International, where I spent the bulk of my time. And then um, I had been there for obviously quite a long time, so it was time for a new challenge, and that's when I moved on to MeUndies. Amazing. That, Robinson's May, that's a throwback. Yeah, it is a throwback, right? I don't know. <laughs> that may just be familiar to us. I'm not sure. Uh, no, that's great. Um, so Christina and I obviously partner very closely together, but why don't you talk to them about how we how the planning process is like at Mandy's, how we go about determining buys for these styles? Yeah, so my team is responsible for inventory and ensuring that we maintain enough supply to satisfy demand and meet the financial goals of the company, but not too much that we have excess inventory that becomes hard to sell and therefore ties up company cash and also takes up physical space. So in thinking about how we do this, I kind of break up planning into three main buckets, post-season analysis, pre-season planning, and in-season maintenance. So post-season analysis looks at sales and inventory levels down to the category, collection, style, color, size level to understand how actual sales compared to our expectations and therefore how well we sold through of what we bought, meaning the number of units we sold as a percentage of the number of units we bought. So through this type of analysis, we can identify a strong selling product that may have exceeded our revenue and sell through expectations, meaning we ran out of inventory while the demand was still there. Conversely, we also want to look for product that didn't sell as quickly, therefore leaving us with excess inventory at the end of the intended selling window. So the purpose of this analysis is to inform pre-season planning so that we're always buying better and getting closer to mirroring true demand. So my team manages a sales plan that ladders up to company revenue goals from finance and breaks the plan down by category, collection, gender, style, based on actual and forecasted sales trends. So we then work closely with Jeff and the merchandising team to tweak and perfect the assortment and buy plan based on our postseason analysis learnings to make sure we buy enough of the right product to support the sales plan and the revenue targets. 
And since our weekly print launches are such a huge piece of our business, shout out to Kristen for those awesome drawings, we'll work really closely with merchandising to strategize buy sizes for each of them by identifying a comparable print we launched in the past, maybe a similar animal or food print, analyzing sales and sell through in the first week, first four weeks, first six weeks to help assess demand and whether there was more or less than we bought, and then deciding if we should buy the new print smaller, the same or bigger based on this analysis, as well as forecasted market or product trends that merchandising may bring to the table. So at the end of the day, we're just trying to not ever lose a sale because we're out of stock in a color, style, or size the customer comes looking for. But we also, at the same time, need to be strategically lean with how much we buy so that we are sold out or almost sold out of a product or print when the demand has dwindled and then have the resources and the space to continue buying into future initiatives. So realistically, we can never really project the future perfectly, but leaning on data and historical trends helps us get as close as we can. So then the last piece of that, which is in-season maintenance. So we run very regular reporting um, to analyze sales and sell-through rates so that we're always aware of how sales and inventory are flowing week to week, and we can therefore react as we need to. So for example, we may see that a few weeks after launch, a certain style or print isn't selling as much or as quickly as we expected. And we may want to run a promotion on that product to help us move through the inventory before it sits on the site for too much longer and just becomes harder to sell over time. So on the opposite hand, if we launch a print that blows out off the bat, we may work with merchandising and production to schedule a relaunch as soon as we can restock it, knowing that there was additional demand left on the table. So those are some of the main functions of planning. Um, and while each member of this panel has very unique responsibilities, each of our roles are very much in support of the other. And we all collaborate very closely day in and day out. So these right here, this panel is definitely my people. Um, so collectively, we're responsible for providing the right product and the right quantities at the right time and at the right price to our customers, like Jeff said earlier. And so while my piece of this is to provide the right quantities, I can't do that without this panel. So I lean on the product team to provide context on projected trends and the vision of the assortment and we decide on buy sizes collectively. So for example, I, I depend on them to let me know if a new product launch or color is just a test or intended to reach a limited audience and there were, therefore we should buy it small or whether it's something we really believe in as the next best thing and we wanna go big on. So then I lean on Stacy's team to tell us when we need to submit our orders to make sure we receive the product in time for its intended selling window, which is super important. Um, because for example, if we receive Halloween printed product or costumes too close to Halloween or even after Halloween, it won't sell. And I'll have the challenge of figuring out what to do with the extra inventory once the demand for it has passed. So that, that's a bit about me and how the planning process works at MeUndies. That was great. And it highlights how collaborative this process is. Every we, we own these decisions together. There's not one decision maker. Um, and I mean, Christina, how often do things go exactly as planned? Like, yeah, never. never. <laughs> Planners aren't really ever right. We try to get as right as we possibly can. We're never going to get it perfect. We just accept that and we get better as we go. Exactly. That's I think that's the biggest lesson for planners. It's like it you, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can predict the future. But with we it. We get as close as possible and learn. We learn a lot. Yes. Um thanks, Christina. Um, so that kind of shows the product life cycle from merchandising, creating the roadmap, design, creating new concepts, um, production, sourcing materials. <clears throat> gathering the cost, identifying our vendor partner to production and planning, managing all that inventory. So through all of this, once we've placed an order, we're waiting for it to get produced. But in the meantime, our marketing team, who's not represented on this call, but does a lot of work to support the launch of these new products and prints. So growth marketing works on retention, acquisition. So they pull together ads. Our creative team does a great new campaign for every product or every print. So for the taco print, <clears throat> they'll do a live lifestyle shoot. We'll have e-commerce images. We'll have lifestyle shots. We'll go shoot on location perhaps at a taco joint. Um, but this comes to life and then our marketing leads create different assets for ads. So 
social media marketing on Instagram, on Facebook, but we create emails that go out the moment these things launch, which go to our email lists and to our members and followers, and they immediately click and buy. Um, so it's a 360 campaign that goes into launch day and our members are always waiting for the next new print to launch. And it's, a, it's an exciting day and we're constantly monitoring sales hour by hour to see how things perform. So it all pays off in the end and it's very rewarding to see these products come to life. Um, so with that, I think we can open it up to questions. I am happy to take over, Jeff, but thank you for that. And I must say, guys, we've had a few panels of cross-functional team members, and you really do seem to be so genuinely collaborative and happily so. So thanks for sharing um, the energy and the enthusiasm. Um, speaking of enthusiasm, we did get a comment. It's not a question from uh, a gentleman who's very excited about your men's pouch thong, best on the market. So. Yes, that I'm so happy to hear that. That's one of our newest uh, products. And that really came about because we wanted to be all inclusive. We, we, we knew that men wear all different styles, not just boxer briefs. And we wanted to create that perfect thong that they can't find anywhere else. So I'm excited to hear that feedback. It's selling out. We can't keep it in stock. So that's in line with sales. But thank you. Yeah, no. So Jeremy says that uh, I have to tell you that you guys are killing it. Your men's pouch thong is the best on the market. And I literally log on every morning to see if there's one more in stock or a new print in my size as you sell out so quickly. Bravo for creating such an amazing, covetable piece of product. Hopefully you will have more stock and prints available in the future. And I think this is for you, Kristen. Hashtag unicorn thong. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> More right. talk coming soon. Sorry about that, but we're, we're chasing it. <laughs> okay, well, I think uh, in addition to Jeremy, you probably have some very happy other customers. Um, a couple of questions that. and in no particular order, but um, you, know, you touched on it, uh, Jeff, a little bit, but the question is, do you encourage customer feedback and how do you use that feedback in the design process? And you talked a little bit about this is purely an online business. And so you have an ability perhaps to connect with a consumer a little bit more directly. So how does that work and how does that feedback inform your choices and, and, and then in turn the choices of your team members? Yeah, so all different angles. So social media is one source that our followers, customers, members, they go on and tell us we want a, a llama print and we'll see a number of requests for the same thing. And we'll take that, they pass that on to our product team and we, we wanna design that. We wanna give customers what they're looking for. So that's one angle. Um, customer service, they also gather requests just from their interactions with our customers that they'll pass along to us. But also when we're considering new prints or new products like a pouch thong for men, we do surveys, we do customer surveys. So we'll work with our consumer insights team and say, these are the things we're thinking of launching. Can we get some insight into who will the customer be that's buying it? And what would the demand look like to make sure that we're launching things that people want? Um, so we actively create surveys, send them to customers, both members and non-members um, to see what their interest is in those things. So even prints, we'll put out print surveys, we'll have a ton of different prints on them, we'll see what people like, and they can tell us what they wanna see next. So it's a fun process to include the customer. Yeah, no, that, I love hearing how, how insightful that can be and how informative it can be of your process. We have a question about how are you all overcoming the current global supply chain challenges or how are you, I should say, working to overcome them? But then a more specific question from Ian, have you modified your design and development calendar in reaction to the supply chain challenges? Are you designing earlier, committing sooner? Anybody jump in? We're designing now for 2025. No, <laughs> our calendar. <laughs> That's no. very proactive of you. Jeff. No, we, but we have increased our lead times, but I'll let Stacy talk to that. 
Oh yeah, very near and dear to all of our hearts. Um, we have, just for reference, like our lead times, we have taken the, like on the water for a boat. That's what you usually want to ship by for cost purposes. That used to be a good old 45 to 55 days. Um, we just recently took that up to, I know, right, Jeff? See you smiling, remember that time? Um, we just recently took that up to 110 days actually. So that's over three months on the water that it's taking to get here. And guys, it's still not getting here on time. Um, so we're doing our best, just as Christina mentioned, those we're really trying to get them in house. Uh, some of them are stuck in at the port that our logistics department is fighting tooth and nail to get them out of there. Um, factory closures during um, COVID early on were a pretty, I mean, big deal for everybody. Those hit us pretty hard. That caused like an immediate five day, excuse me, five week delay in everything that we were doing. Factory capacities decreased. They've still decreased because COVID is still very much upon us as we sit here virtually. Um, and with the increase of all those lead times, we have had to bump up our development and when that occurs. Um, lovely Kristen there just got done, are still in the midst of developing three seasons at once, excuse me, three quarters at once. Um, we typically don't do that. Uh, we de develop one quarter at a time and that's that and everyone, you know, gets some time. Um, but so it's been a pretty it's been crunch time for our team for sure for the last two years. Um, but we have collaborated, communicated with one another. We are constant communicate in constant communication, making sure like, hey guys, goalposts change. Gonna need this yesterday if we can make that happen. Um, luckily, we've got an amazing team that does make that happen. But indeed, things are strained, but we, we are getting through it. And you will still see new prints and new products on the site just might be a week or two late. Nice. Thanks for that. Um, this, Kristen, is a little bit for you, but I think with with maybe Jeff and Christina um, jumping in, I assume Kristen creates wonderful fun designs that are often hard not to go forward with. How does merchandising narrow in and eliminate design for productions? What, what happens to designs that don't make it for the current order? It's a tough call to make. There are <laughs> so many great options in a so given sweet. season. Um, <laughs> But it really comes down to creating a calendar. So when we're looking at a snapshot of the full quarter, we need to balance color, we need to balance theme. We can't do all animals, we can't do all mythical creatures, all foods. So we have to pick and choose within a season how many of each we can do. And from a color standpoint, we need a balance. We can't do we know black cells, we know blue cells, we can't do all black and blue backgrounds. Um, so some of those prints that may be an extra blue background that may not fit in this season will hold for another season. We may even hold it for the following year if we love it so much. So we never really throw out prints we love. We kind of just hold them until a future date where we can adopt them. Um, but it's a tough process. And then we'll work with planning to say, well, how big could this print be? from a buy perspective versus this one. And we may need to fill in with a higher revenue generating print um, if that makes sense for that particular month. I think something I've experienced as well, just as an artist, you know, I have good days and bad days, I'm still a human. And so I'll, you know, get sort of a sense, maybe I'm searching online and seeing that, you know, yetis are trending for holiday and I got to get on it. I got to make something now, now, now. And sometimes, you know, I just stall out and it's hard. I can't get there. I, I just make something I'm not happy with. And I think that's another story of my story and of the team story that uh, works well, that we sort of challenge each other. You know, I'll, I'll sometimes just write Dev and say like, please just give me feedback on this real quick. What do you think? Da, da, da and just his sense for what our customer wants or what he knows I'm capable of doing, or or even sometimes we'll just be like, I don't know, just take a break or, you know, like, and and that's kind of part of the development process that I, you know, didn't really dive into, but it's very much a part of my process. And uh, a lot of times I'll design a print that I'm so excited about that I am like obsessed with. And then the next year, yeah, and it doesn't make the calendar for reasons that Jeff just mentioned, and then the next year I'll make something that's way better. And I'll just, cause I've evolved as an artist and I'm so much more happy with the, you know, or there's a new trend that's come out that's even more popular. And so all that to say, I've learned to let some of those go from a personal note, if that's sort of where the question is coming from as well, I will sort of let my children 
go and just say, okay, that's fine. It'll either come back in a different form or maybe even better. And since I've seen that year over year and season over season now, it's easier for me to let it go. Cause I'll say, okay, it'll come back bigger and better than ever. And I'm okay with that, you know? Thanks for that. Cause as someone who's often grappled with creatives, like that's a very evolved perspective on just letting it go. Thank you. Listen, <laughs> so I have this quote, I always say, just let, you know, Jeff take the wheel. That's just where we're at. <laughs> WWJD, what would Jeff do? That's just where I'm always at, <laughs> which is great. That's what you want. You know, you want a teammate that challenges you to be better. And I think once you release your pride and ego as an artist, like that, you can get there, right? So you see people challenging you and you don't see it as a personal dig. You don't see it as, you know, they're saying you're awful. No, of course not. You're sitting in the seat of this dream job. So you're still there or else they, you wouldn't be. So, you know, I now see that as, oh, this is great. I'm going to develop and be better or make a better print. So it is I, hard though. I think an important thing to remember is that a merchandiser's role is to be the voice of the customer. And so any feedback or opinion shouldn't be my own. It shouldn't be about what I want or what I'm looking for. So when we're able to think objectively like that, I don't think this will be right for this, the customer at this moment in time, then I think it's easier to have these conversations that it's not personal, it's about the customer. <clears throat> And we have so much data to validate these decisions, you know, like when we're deciding between two prints, we all internally love them, but how do we pick, you know, which one? Um, obviously, we'll look at the full calendar, like Jeff was saying, and then we can also look to previous sales from comparable prints. So we lean on the data a lot too, you know, we've released a print a week for how many years? So there's been a lot of prints out there in the world. So most likely we have some, something good to compare to. Um, so that's also very, very helpful in, in the process as well. Yeah, and that's really interesting Jeff, to hear that it's it's neither personal for you or or Kristen for, for similar reasons in a sense, because again, to Kristen's yeah. point, this is a business, you're, you're meant to be selling. And so your perspective is objective on this. Um, a question from Emma for you, Christina. What was it like working internationally? International is a whole nother beast. Mm -hmm. um, Skechers is a big company. And so we were present in a lot of countries. And for me, it was just very, very eye-opening to learn about all of these different cultures and to learn about market differences and to really decide like from a company perspective, like, okay, we have kind of like our domestic market figured out. Um, but now dealing with international, it's just, it's a whole other beast. And how much do you want to kind of tow the company line and you know what our stores look like here basically need to be mimicked abroad versus how do we kind of learn what the markets look like there? How do we adapt to that? And how do we kind of like, you know, change our strategy to kind of make more sense in another market? Um, so that was a big learning curve for me and just for our company in general, um, where, you know, we're used to opening domestically like huge, huge stores and a store had to be a certain number of square feet in order to even consider opening it, where that footprint doesn't make any sense in some of these other countries. You can't even get a location that big. So are we okay with that? And if so, then how do we kind of like adapt the assortment to sort of make sense with that? So it's really interesting to just um, kind of learn what all of these markets looked like abroad, how they differed from each other, and then how we needed to adapt as a company to make sure we made sense in those markets. And obviously you're dealing with different seasons when it's summer here, it's winter somewhere else. So how do you offer product, you know, that makes sense in that market at that time? So yeah, it's a whole other animal, but um, very interesting and very eye-opening for me. I, I love my time in international. Nice. Thanks for that. Because I think I have time for two more. One is, um, what skills do you believe uh, help you to succeed in your daily roles? And I want to tie that maybe to, because you have sort of disparate backgrounds and school backgrounds. Was there something you wish you had studied when you were in school that you now realize, you know, if well, I knew a little bit more about that, that would be super helpful to me in my current day job? For me... Um, like I mentioned, I studied economics, went to business school, but loved fashion and wanted to be um, in this industry and merchandising allowed me to do that. Um, but I actually wish I had gone to design school. I actually wish I had learned 
to design and and learn technical design and construction and pattern making, all those other skills so I could better understand my cross-functional partners and how things come to life. I'm kind of learning it on the job or learning it throughout my career, but had I had that initial foundation in addition to the, the other stuff, I think that would have been great for merchandising. Nice. Thanks, Jeff. Anybody else? And I can attest to that. I think Jeff is like a designer deep down. And that's why I really value his opinion. He has a very creative eye that challenges me and that's hard to find. So I agree with that. <laughs> I think Jeff, it's never too late, you know, just go and get that, <laughs> get, take those classes and make an amazing sweater line or something. That's all black all, every day. <laughs> um, I think something for me, uh, you know, I did a lot of the graphic design courses in school because I was coming from all my family members have been doctors and engineers and, you know, uh, I don't know, entrepreneurs and kind of just had this business mindset. And so when I was the, you know, weird kid that went to art school, I tried to make myself marketable, tried to convince my parents this time I'm going to make money. And so I, I wish uh, in hindsight, you know, I did eventually kind of steer into being an illustrator, which is what I really do love doing. Um, but it took a lot of sort of molding into that throughout my courses. And so I wish I had thought of that or knew that early on. I wish I had just immediately gone with my gut and said, no, don't take the graphic design course. Don't take the web design course. That's not you. And obviously it's not, you know. So I wish I had heard more of that internal voice going. And then once I was in my senior year, I was taking, you know, every course I ever dreamt of. And I wish I thought of that early on. So nice. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, Stacy, Christina, anything that maybe had you, you wish you studied a little more of when you were in school? Yeah, I think I echo uh, Jeff's, Jeff's comment. Um, as you guys, you know, I said in the beginning, I didn't go to school for any of this. I was looking, you know, for business. Um, this is very much, I mean, it's business, but I'm developing clothing and apparel. Um, so it's a little different. I think having a, a larger foundation for like fabrics and, you know, how things are done. I've learned a great deal in the last 13 years that, you know, have allowed me to be where I am today. Um, but not to say that I couldn't, you know, not saying like go further, but I couldn't be of a better resource. I couldn't, you know, kind of jump to some things quicker. So I think, you know, having go to design school would have been a pretty good thing, but, you know, stay lobby. Here we are. <laughs> nice. Um, one more question, guys, and, the, it, and this can be sort of rapid fire answer. And Kristen, you talked about it a little bit, but we always like to ask our panelists, especially because our audience is students or very recent graduates. So what would your advice to your younger self be um, from your now position a little further along in your careers looking back? I'll, I'll go. D you're going to get a degree in something that doesn't mean that's what you have to do. You can easily pivot. Don't get tied down to, you know, this is a, this is a hard time. You're spending a lot of time cranking out everything that you're doing right now. If you want to change later in life, it's totally possible. You're not, you're not hamstrung by anything that you're looking into now. So just know that pivoting is possible. It's acceptable and you'll likely be just as successful. Thanks, Stacey. Anybody else? I, it's a cliche, but it's follow your passion because I think I felt so many, I felt pressure from all sides to stick within a box when I was in college and follow a more practical path. And like I said, I would have loved to, I say, I always say when I grow up, I want to be a designer. Still, I still say that, but had it gone to design school. We're waiting for you. Yeah. Right. But, um, but I, I made, I found a path that I really love and enjoy, but follow that passion and the success will come. Nice. Thanks. Christina, what about you? Totally agree with what Jeff just said. I mean, really just stick with what you really love, find those interests and go for it. You spend a lot of time working in your adult life, a lot of time with your coworkers. I feel like my coworker, this group knows me more than a lot of other people in my life. Um, so make sure you're doing something, you're spending all that time doing something that you really love. And, and same, Stacey, I think what everyone said so far has been so great. I mean just because you're comfortable somewhere, but it's not necessarily like, you know, you don't feel hundred percent about it. Like don't get stuck, you know? And to be honest, like I kind of felt like I did that a bit at Skechers. I was with Skechers for 12 years. And part of that over time was like, I wasn't being challenged anymore per se, but I was comfortable there. So I just kind of ran with it for a bit. And I wish that I had kind of been a little bit more proactive and pivoting earlier. 
Um, I'm so happy that I made the move to MeUndies. I have learned so much in the past two years. It's amazing. I feel like I've been there for 10 years in that sense. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it is easy to get comfortable along the way, um, but if it's not 100%, then don't be afraid to move on. Thanks for that. I think there's, I'm picking up on an overarching theme here, and I think Kristen, you embodied it in terms of truly following your passion and and being where you are and doing something you truly. It's quite clear you really love. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you, Peter. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's true. It's a payoff. I mean, it really is. You go towards what what you love, and you'll be the best at it. That's the secret sauce because you will love what you're doing. So you'll perfect your craft. You'll work hard. You'll be working so hard that you fall asleep doing it, but yet you're so, you come to life because you're working hard, so. Nice, that's a fitting and perfect end. Thanks, Kristen, to a really wonderful session, guys. And, you know, I, I didn't ascribe to what would Jeff say, but now I realize I better start paying more attention. There you go. Well, we need to make bracelets. What would <laughs> um, and I'm gonna have to check out the men's pouch thong right away and see if I can. Um, yes, so, uh, check it out. Uh, Hashtag unicorn thong. <laughs> this was really great, really informative. Thanks for being so thoughtful and so honest. We really, really appreciate it. Um, terrific session. Thanks, Jeff, for moderating. And thank you all for all of your thoughts. Good night, thank everybody. You. Thank you for having thank us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.